Good morning and welcome to Let's Talk Autism with Nancy and no Shannon. I'm sorry to say my dear friend and colleague is uh, out with, uh, she's feeling under the weather this morning and um, I encouraged her to stay home. I miss her. Uh, I hope I did her justice in this last hour with Dr. Doreen. Uh, Shannon's far more knowledgeable than I am on ABA, but um, Doreen is just was such a wealth of information. So I hope you always tune into that each and every Wednesday at 10 o'clock. And now we are turning to Let's Talk Autism. And I'm going to start with, in the news, um, some very provocative um, articles coming out about Donald Trump, which is no surprise. Wherever we have Donald Trump, we seem to have controversy, don't we? Um, one article um, says that uh, Donald Trump um, is about to make another idiotic move. He believes that appointing radical right-wing radio host Michael Savage to head the National Institutes of Health would bring some much needed common sense to the agency. Uh, according to Media Matters for America, Savage believes that autism is one big lie. It's a huge racket in the medical industry, according to Savage, and essentially doesn't exist. In 2008, he made the following statements. I'll tell you what autism is. In 90%, 9% of the cases, it's a brat who hasn't been told to cut the act out. That's what autism is. What do you mean they scream and they're silent? They don't have a father around to tell them, don't act like a moron. You'll get nowhere in life. Stop acting like a putz. Straighten up, act like a man. Don't sit there crying and screaming, idiot. Okay, Mr. Savage, I would like you to walk a mile in an autism parent's shoes, or even a minute for that matter. But there was a massive backlash following that statement. ABC News reported that he doubled down on his offensive and ignorant remarks, saying, my comments about autism were meant to boldly awaken parents and children to the medical community's attempt to label too many children or adults as autistic, just as some drug companies have overdiagnosed ADD and ADHD to peddle dangerous speed-like drugs to children as young as four years of age. This cartel of doctors, drug companies, is now creating a national panic by overdosing autism for which there is no definitive medical diagnosis. Hello, where have you been, Mr. Savage, on that front? Um, we do know that he said all of those things. What we don't know is really what the true story is with Trump. Um, we don't know, in fact, that Trump has gone on the line saying he wants Savage to head up the NIH crowd um, for the uh, head up the NIH. Um, and there is another article out of the Inquisitor saying that in an October 20, uh, October 6 interview with Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump, syndicated radio host Michael Savage mentioned that he hopes Trump will appoint him as the National Institute of Health director. Trump didn't deny outright the radio host's request, and that has what got has many people wondering if this might become a reality. Um, Media Matters for America reports that Savage offered to become head of the NIH when and if Trump becomes president. Savage holds degrees in medical botany, I guess he knows a lot about marijuana, medical anthropology, and nutritional ethnomedicine, I'm not really sure what that is, and asserted he would be the best man for the job. When you become president, I want you to consider appointing me to head the NIH, is what Savage said to Mr. Trump. I will make sure that America has real science and real medicine again in this country because I know the corruption. I know how to clean it up, and I know how to make real research work again. Trump acknowledged Savage's request with a positive reply, yet the response was more of a courteous comment rather than a commitment. I think it goes a little beyond courteous, though. He said, I think that's great. And I think that, frankly, well, you know you'd get common sense if that were the case that I can tell you because I hear so much about the NIH, and it's terrible. 
Okay, so we're not really sure where the truth lies, although we do know that Donald Trump said to Michael Savage, who has denied autism as a condition, who has called our children spoiled brats, who has called out parents on not good parenting skills, we do know that Donald Trump said to him, I think that's great, enough, no commentary there. Okay, uh, the next story is studying prodigies could be a key to an autism breakthrough. This is from the Business Insider. Two academics, David Feldman and Martha Morlock, once complained, only somewhat facetiously, that divine inspiration, reincarnation, or magical incantation were the best explanation for child prodigies. Science had no real explanation for that. But now psychologist, psychologist Joanne Ruth Satz, excuse me, Joanne, if I botched your name, developed a startling hunch after a chance encounter with a music prodigy's autistic cousin. Could autism have something to do with prodigious, prodigious talent? The answer seems to be yes. Autism prodigies don't typically have autism, but many, aut many prodigies have autistic relatives, brothers, sisters, uncles, grandmothers. Some have autism in every twig and branch of the family tree. Bottom line on this is the Ohio State University team and Dr. Ruth Satz are studying a chromosome mutation, uh, chromosome one, a mutation on chromosome one that some prodigies and an in in, in autist, it's an interesting term, autist, um, share. Uh, the connection's fascinating. It offers an unexpected perspective on the riddle of the prodigy's talent, intriguing take on what drives children to hone their skills with laser-like focus and intensity. So because they appear to share this gene on chromosome one, they have a common foundation. So there is going to be ongoing research on this to see that uh, if there is any common uh, commonality between prodigies and autistic individuals. So uh, hopefully we'll hear, hear more on that. Uh, now we always like to give you good news uh, to start the end the news. And uh, what's not to love about Adele, her voice, her personality, everything about her. She's just such a stunning talent. And um, she fulfilled the dream of a 12-year-old girl with autism. She invited her on stage. When Emily Tamman came to a recent Adele show at a Manchester, England arena, she had one goal, to perform on stage with her favorite artist, Adele. Armed with a sign that read, it is my dream to sing with Adele, the 12-year-old British girl stood in the crowd and waited for her moment. With just a few songs left in the show, the 25 artist finally spotted Tamman's sign. She invited her up on stage to sing. She proceeded to belt out an impressive rendition of Someone Like You as the audience erupted in cheers. How great is that? Um, also, Tamman's father told the Manchester Evening News that the moment was particularly special because she does have autism. Um, that Adele had no idea about that fact. It was later revealed. Uh, she also has ADHD and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, type 3, a condition that causes chronic pain and limb weakness. Adele was so nice to do that, said the dad. She clearly didn't have to. Emily said she wants to show people that have disabilities or mental issues they can still do mainstream things like singing. They should not be stopped from doing them. So, Emily, we are so happy for you today. And Adele, once again, you approved. You are not only one of the most beautiful voices we have ever heard in the history of music, you are a class act. Um, I am gonna take a break now. And uh, when we come back, I believe, I've got, I lost my IFB for a minute, Kelby. We're gonna get Jack Creamer. Um, he's going to be joining, joining us via Skype. He's an Emmy award-winning producer, videographer, he, and editor based out of Denver, Colorado. And he now has produced his first documentary feature film. It's called Programming Hope. 
and uh, it's about employment and autism and it's a very important subject matter. We're going to find out what inspired Jack to make this film and uh, how you can see it and what it's all about. So stay with us. And Shannon Penrod, if you're watching from home, I miss you. We'll be back. Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. I am missing my partner in, in crime here, uh, Shannon Penrod. She is out feeling under the weather this morning, so let's all send our healing energy to Shannon so we can get her back. We miss her enormously. I might even have to call into her at the end of the show just to talk to her and find out how I did on Ask Dr. Doreen. Um, it just feels so strange not to have her next to me. Um, anyway, we are, as promised, we are back with uh, our guest, Jack Creamer. Uh, Jack is an Emmy Award winning producer, editor, videographer. He is based in Denver, Colorado. He's a 1991 graduate of Texas A&M, started his career in local television as a sports photographer and producer. In 2003, he used those skills to launch Creek Tree Films, and um, he produced a documentary called Programming Hope. Welcome to the show, Jack. Hi. Thanks for having me. Good to have you here. Um, Jack, first of all, Programming Hope, your first documentary. Tell us about it. What is it about? Uh, Programming Hope was basically made uh, to kind of put a spotlight on employment issues for adults on the spectrum. Um, it's kind of a, a positive, uplifting look at one particular place that's had a lot of success um, employing adults on the spectrum. So uh, it's about the non Institute, which trains and employs adults to develop apps and video games for iPads, iPhones, uh, Android phones, all that kind of thing. Okay, great. We're going to get into non in more detail in a moment. Um, tell us a little bit about um, employment and autism. What, what are the facts and the figures on autism and employment with uh, young adults and beyond? Well, some of the, the facts are that 90% of adults that are on the spectrum are either unemployed or underemployed. So they may have jobs that you know are way below their skill sets uh, or they have trouble keeping a job uh, you know if you talk to s some of these guys you know they may have had you know six seven eight jobs in a in a short period of uh, time mm. uh, because they didn't fit their skill sets or they weren't interested in what they were doing or you know there was a lack of understanding from the employer about the accommodations that maybe need to be made for somebody that's on the spectrum or the other issue is maybe that individual doesn't want to let their employer know that they're on the spectrum. Maybe they have Asperger's, they're high functioning and they can kind of get by. But then there's a misunderstanding from the employer about why they may do certain things or act a certain way and maybe that particular job just doesn't fit them. Okay, well Jack, I, I know you, you, your intention is to, uh, that this is a positive film, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. But when, as a mom of a 14-year-old with autism, and I hear you say uh, the stats on autism and employment and uh, the problem, how, how can I be hopeful? Well, I think the reason to be hopeful is that there are things happening right now. Um, I did this film to spotlight one of them, but there's a lot of other things going on right now because people are finally starting to kind of talk about it, I think. Uh, you hear great stories about car washes where a father has employed his son and others, you know, to work at a car wash. You hear about a jewelry factory, you know, where they're putting jewelry together. Higher functioning people like at the non Institute that are interested in coding and video games and things like that. They're becoming coders and programmers. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a lot of, there's kind of a grassroots effort on all sorts of levels of the spectrum to you know to create these options out there and I think employers at traditional workplaces are starting to think about it too uh, Microsoft uh, you know uh, SAP you know you hear a lot of different initiatives where they're kind of scratching the surface about how can we use the abilities of, of this uh, workforce and not push them aside and, and you know, use them to their maximum potential. 
Jack, what what prompted you to make this film? I mean, you you have a, a history in uh, a great background in, in television production. Um, what what made you uh, veer towards autism? Do you have it in your own family? What what's the story behind that? Uh, I do. I don't I don't have kids myself, but my sister has an adult son mm. that's on the autism spectrum. Uh, when he was 16, uh, they came to Denver and on a trip to visit. Uh, he had been homeschooled by my sister uh, ever since he was you know, a little kid. Um, he, uh, she had all the answers basically you know, to get him to where he needed to be by the time he was 18. She spoke to me during that trip and said she really didn't have any answers at that point uh, mm -hmm. after that. like. Okay, what's next? Mm -hmm. They uh, call it. We call it falling off the cliff, Jack. Absolutely. That's absolutely. what mom. That's what us autism parents call it, falling off the cliff. So you know, and and you know, knowing my sister and and the um, everything she had done to that mm -hmm. point, I was kind of taken aback that she, you know, didn't really have any options, or that there weren't any options there at the time, and and how much she was struggling with that. So I didn't have any intention of making a film at the time, but I did go on the internet kind of after that trip. I looked up for myself to see was there things out there, you know, being done. And what was kind of shocking at that point, I found virtually nothing. And not just in the United States, but I mean, I was looking all over the world at different things and there just wasn't a whole lot of people, there weren't a whole lot of people talking about it. And um, I thought, well, it might be a good idea to, you know, I know there's a lot of, of sad negative stories about that issue. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something where if you could spotlight something positive, this might inspire others to, you know, think about this issue and maybe do some things. And, you know, that was the initial intent. And that's kind of what led me to this particular story. And that's how it got started. So a personal connection, uh, which tends to be the case uh, always in people that are drawn to this, uh, to doing work in the autism field. And uh, w as you started doing research in 2012 on this, you found information about the Nonpareil Institute. I want to get more into detail about what their work is with you when we come back. Uh, so we'll be back more with Jack Creamer, who is the force behind the film Programming Hope about the issues of employment and individuals with autism. So important uh, to families today. So stay with us. We'll be back with more. And we are back with Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. As you can see, I'm flying solo today without my buddy Shannon Penrod. And we are continuing our conversation with Jack Creamer. Jack is the maker of the documentary film Programming Hope. Um, he is also the uncle of uh, 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 his nephew has autism, which sort of inspired him to make this film. Uh, welcome back, Jack. Thanks. Okay. Um, you started doing research for the film in 2012. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, and you came across this Nonpareil uh, Institute. Can you tell us about what they're doing at Nonpareil and why it's so special? Well, as I said in the last segment, I, I didn't really find a whole lot of positive stories, and uh, I was posting on forums and message boards and things like that. And um, a person that I interviewed actually kind of led me to them, and what they do according to you know the website that I found was they train and employ adults that are on the spectrum uh, to develop and design video games and apps mm -hmm. so so they come up with the ideas they code them they they do everything the art the 3d modeling the whole bit so I saw that and I was like wow that's that sounds really cool and that sounds like something a mainstream audience would be uh, interested in. I mean, everybody has an iPhone, an iPad, you know, they're all, everybody's familiar with an app and a game. So um, I decided I'd call them and find out what exactly they were doing. And it was actually more impressive than even what the website, once I went, went down there. Um, it's the creation of uh, a man named Dan Selleck, who's a uh, software developer it comes from a background in technology he's also a former professional race car driver which is interesting um, he has a son that's on the spectrum and he decided that he was going to take it upon himself to come up with a solution for him and maybe that solution would help other people as well 
So he created the Nonpareil Institute. So by the time he did that in his kitchen, he had a handful of students and they started in the kitchen. Necessity and is the mother of invention, correct? Absolutely, Jack? absolutely. So there was no, you know, he didn't do this with a bunch of funding from any sort of big corporations or grants or anything. He just did this, you know, in his kitchen with a few computers and, and, and you know, use what he knew as a father and as a software developer to kind of see if this would work. It was kind of a test. And one student became eight students, eight students became 30, 30 became 50. Uh, by the time I showed up, um, when I went down there and started shooting, they had around 45 to 50 crew members. And I call them crew members because they start out sort of as a student, but this is not a school. They'll tell you it's not a school. There's no grades or anything like that. It's a training program. And so they start training them uh, to learn how to develop additional levels to games that a lot of these guys already play at home, mm -hmm. which is very, very fast. I mean, you should see the look on these guys' faces when they say, okay, you love playing this game? Well, we're going to train, train you to develop a new level for that game. It's very exciting. And so a lot of these guys get really into that aspect of it. Once they do that, uh, the next step is they usually become part-time employees, and then they train other new crew members that come into the program. Uh, as they work their way up, some the eventual goal and the eventual uh, path uh, that they hope for all of them is that they become full-time employees. Now, that doesn't mean they're all employed full-time yet, but that's the goal they're pushing for. But they do have full-time employees that are on staff that have started from the bottom and you know have worked their way up to the top. And those those guys are doing high-level coding mm -hmm. and actually have apps in the App Store and the Google Play stores that you can buy today, so. It's fantastic, so encouraging. Um, and maybe we could use uh, your connections with Dan Selleck to get him on the show sometime in the future. Absolutely, okay, yeah, great. you know, he so, might be interested. Sounds like a fascinating man. Uh, I just love these stories of uh, parents that take it into their own hands, and um, he sounds a lot like the Danish entrepreneur. Are, are you familiar with Torkel Sine? Yes, I am. Yes, mm -hmm. and Special Eastern, who is out of mm -hmm. Denmark, who did, has done a very similar thing. Um, now, um, I want to hear about some of the people featured in the film that you zeroed in on. Can you tell us about a few of them? Uh, one of them, uh, his name is Aaron. He uh, actually, his app is actually, you know, developed in the film and then actually gets, uh, you know, released as, the, as we shot the film. Um, he was a recent high school graduate who basically didn't have any programming experience whatsoever. He'll tell you, you know, the only real computer knowledge he had was opening up a Word document or, you know, typing an email. He wasn't a programmer by any stretch of, you know, the imagination. Uh, he did, had no idea what he wanted to do in his life, and he would basically, you know, kind of just play games. And he thought maybe, maybe he could maybe work at a GameStop, you know, and that might be something that would fit his skill set. Mm -hmm. um, he ended up learning multiple languages, coding languages, uh, developed his own game from his own idea, got it into the App Store, and you know you can play that game at Chili's restaurants on a table kiosk. Uh, you can download it on um, multiple platforms. Um, and here was somebody that you know, you know, if you asked him before he entered the program, he probably would never dream he could have uh, done anything like that because of the challenges he did have. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he felt comfortable, you know, at Nonpareil because that's kind of the model that they're working with is a comfortable envir environment where, you know, everyone's treated as equals. You're not trying to fit them into, and you know, a situation or a, or a workplace that doesn't, you know, fit their needs. Uh, and it lets them thrive. So that's kind of what Dan has tried to implement down there, and it, you know, it, it seems very, you know, very effective for the group. Hey, that's a remarkable story. Um, I think so many times we underestimate uh, our young adults on the spectrum, and and every, all individuals on the autism spectrum. And this right. just shows you how they can really you can raise the bar, and they can they can rise to it. Um, Dan, the film premiered in Dallas in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about the response that you've gotten, that you got from it, and you've also been showing it around the country since November. 
yeah, the response has been great. And um, my goal is to get it, you know, in as many theaters and, and, and as many eyeballs in front of it as possible because I think it's an important film. You know, sometimes uh, people think if you don't have a connection with autism that maybe, oh, well, that's not for me or, you know, that they wouldn't be interested in it. Uh, it was really designed to be a mainstream film so that maybe a neurotypical audience would kind of, you know, maybe understand what it means to be an adult on the spectrum a little bit better. And uh, we've had great response from from uh, you know parents, from people on the spectrum, from uh, you know neurotypical you know groups, all of them you know because the film is uplifting. It's uh, it can be funny at times, it can be touching and 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 uh, emotional at times, but uh, there's a little something for everybody, and and the response has been great. And theaters, you know, independent theaters that we're showing it at on a Wednesday night normally get maybe. 10, 15 people, you know, in the theater to watch a, a film, like an independent film, and we'll come in there and we'll get, you know, 100 plus in there on a Wednesday night, uh, all across the country, and, and the results have been, you know, predictable everywhere we go. Everybody, you know, knows this is an issue if you're affected by it, and they want to come out and see something that's positive and is trying to make a difference. Uh, now, tell us how, how can people get in touch with you, Jack? If they're interested in this, uh, perhaps an independent theater owner, mm -hmm. how can they connect with you to find out how they can get their hands on this film? Uh, the best way right now is to go to our website, programminghope.com. Uh, you can email us. Uh, all of our you know links and connections are on there. We also have a list of all the cities that it's going to be showing at here in the next uh, you know month and or two, and I can give you a list of that as well. Uh, or go to our Facebook page, which is Facebook. Dot com and then uh, slash programming hope capital P and capital H on the on the hope and um, most of our most up to date information is on Facebook but we're going to be in Indianapolis next week uh, Boston the week after okay, Minneapolis. The dates, do you have the dates in front of you? You're going to be in Indianapolis. Yeah, I do, actually. Okay, can yeah. you let us know what those dates are specifically? Indianapolis on March the twenty third. Uh huh. Boston on March the thirtieth. Mm hmm. Minneapolis on uh, April 6th, Washington, D.C. on April 13th, Okay. Chicago on April 20th, and then Houston on April 26th, Dallas on uh, May the 4th, and then we'll be in Los Angeles on May the 9th. Okay. Um, now, if parents uh, or any of the public anybody wants to come and watch these screenings how what's the best way for them to get the information about the theaters where they can find you uh, either on that web page or on Facebook we have all the ticket links and you can purchase some in advance and uh, it's all it's all right there okay um, I want to ask you about uh, so many of our kids do have a technological bent um, mm -hmm. If, as a parent, you have a child that's not necessarily technologically oriented, does that mean that there's less of a chance for employment? Is this something to be concerned about? Well, and like I was saying before, I think Nonpareil and Programming Hope is a great profile of one solution. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's inspirational because I think if you saw the film and you see what they're doing, you can translate kind of the basic model into a bunch of solutions. For example, Don Perel has a, a new campus in Houston that they've just opened up. Uh, one of the students or the crew members down there loves to uh, design high-end uh, cakes, just like you'd see on the Food Network or something mm. like that. They're amazing. And, you know, that has nothing to do with coding or anything like that. But, you know, the talk was, you know, at Don Perel, well, maybe we need to get some sort of culinary kind of path or something like that. So. Whether Nonpareil does that or maybe a baking, you know, company does that, uh, I think there's all sorts of options. There's a uh, Food for Good Thought in Columbus, Ohio, invited us to show the film. What they have is a gluten-free uh, bakery that employs adults on the spectrum, and you know they come up with recipes. They bake, you know, all sorts of, you know, great cookies and cakes and things like that. So I think there's, you know with creative thinking I think there's so many things that can be done 
you know, and I, I think it really is just taking a positive look at it and, and looking at the challenges and, and balancing all that. And I think, you know, the sky's the limit. I, I love that way of thinking, and you're saying this is simply a model of one way of what nonpareil does, but you right. can apply to so many different things. Maybe your child has an interest in animals. Maybe your child has, Absolutely. as you say, an interest in cooking. My child loves art. Uh, but there are all kinds of ways that we can translate these talents um, into you know a broader um, a broader purpose and hopefully employment for our kids. Um, before I let you go, what what would be a message you would say to our viewers today who are you know predominantly parents mm -hmm. uh, and family members of individuals on the autism spectrum? Uh, the film is called Programming Hope. What words of hope, did, uh, Jack, would you give to our viewers today? Uh, I would just say that the hope is the biggest word, and that is that, you know, you should always expect the most out of your children and, and don't accept anything less because, um, you know, with some creative, positive thinking, you know, like I said, the sky's the limit. Uh, it may not be in a traditional workplace. It may be something, you know, it may not be college. It may, you know, you just don't know. And I think each individual is it has their own separate challenges and their own abilities, you know, separate abilities that can really help them excel. And, and I think when you look at that, and you, you accept the fact that maybe this won't be a traditional path, but there are things out there that can really, you know, really give them that independence or that career. And people are out there working on it right now. I mean, this is the beginning of it. You know, this is the ground floor. You know, 15 years from now, this may be completely different. And, you know, we'll look back on this as the, you know, the stone age when it came to employing adults on the spectrum. But uh, I think there's hope out there, and, and I think parents with younger kids you know, should feel good about that. Well, thank you for offering us hope. Jack Creamer, uh, producer of the documentary film Programming Hope, and thank you for joining us today. It's been thank a pleasure you. speaking with you, and the best of luck to you with this film. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, so we will be back with more of Let's Talk Autism with Nancy without Shannon uh, in just a moment. Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. And I have a surprise for you guys. I was feeling very lonely here in the studio. It, um, and I said to Kelby, you know, I really want to get my buddy on the phone here. Uh, I know our viewers miss her, and even though we don't have her on Skype, I didn't do that to her because she's probably in her pajamas, and I wouldn't do that to my worst enemy. Uh, but I do have Shannon with me on my cell phone. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Nancy. Thank you so much for doing the show today. You did such a good job, man. You, you, got, you make make me look bad, but hey, it was Please. so it was so wonderful to watch. Fascinating. Well, Kelby's um, got you see, Kelby's got a beautiful picture of you up, although your hair is longer now. You know, we have to update that open because you know you, you haven't had that dark hair in how long now? Like seven years. No, I'm seven. Kidding. Okay, uh, it's, been, <laughs> it's been several years. I know. <laughs> I know, it's been a really long time. And and I don't weigh what I weighed there either. <laughs> but but we won't talk about that. We won't talk about that. So, um, okay, I just want to, because I've missed you today, I kind of want to get your take on, first of all, let's talk about the end the news stories. Uh, that Donald Trump story about... Uh, you know, appointing Michael Savage, which is, of course, rumor, hearsay, based on the fact that he was on Michael Savage's show on uh, October 6th, and he did uh, say, uh, Michael Savage said to him, when you become president, I want to consider, I want you to consider appointing me head of the NIH because I want America to have real science and yeah. real medicine again. And then... Uh, first of all, what do you think? Of, what do you think? What do you think of Michael Savage, Shannon? You know, I think that Michael Savage is uh, that low form of pond scum that says incendiary things so that he can get ratings for his show. Uh, and I, he, given the opportunity to back down on what he said about autism, he didn't take the gentleman's path and say, "Look, I said this for ratings." 
um, and I may have overstated my position. In fact, as you said, he chose to double down. Yeah, he, very, he, he dug a deeper <laughs> hole, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, here's, here's my issue. As a former teacher, when you allow people in the world to say things like that, and you don't stop them and say, I need to stop you right there, but, but that isn't the truth and you don't know what you're talking about, it, it's, it just it becomes pervasive. And, and we've seen um, in Donald Trump's campaign that he likes to say whatever is on his mind. And I know that, you know, sometimes that's just a really gratifying thing, but, but we've, we're starting to see how that pays off. But if you say, if somebody throws a tomato, uh, you know, why don't you just smack the you-know-what out of them, that people are going to do that. And, and for Tom, Donald Trump, this is not the only issue that he has uh, had somebody say something that is just so clearly inappropriate and that, that he lets go and continues to have relationships with people. It's a little frightening to me. Um, I, I share your, your concern, and I would like to say to Mr. Trump, and I know he's probably not listening to our show, but um, I'd love for him to get a bigger vocabulary, Shannon. If I hear him say one more time, it's great, it's great, it's terrific, it's and if I hear him say one more time, it's terrible, it's terrible, or it's disgusting, I'd really like for him to get a better command of the English language if he thinks he's going to vie for a position as our commander in chief. Um, but um, if he could even consider appointing Michael Savage to the head of the NIH, um, I think we are in real trouble. Then let, let's, I think we're on the same page on that one. Um, what do you think about the story of the prodigies being the key to autism breakthrough? I think it's a really interesting thing, and I, uh, I just hope that people, you know, we've talked about this before, that um, it's so interesting, people's perceptions of autism, that they either think Rain Man, or a lot of times they'll think, oh, well, your child must be a genius at something, and when you tell them that your child has autism, they ask, what's their special talent? Like, you know, they're one of the Marvel superheroes. <laughs> um, so I think the, I think the, the study's really interesting, and I hope it, it uh, garners really great things for our kids. I just hope that the mainstream public doesn't further assume that but this is this is all of our children that they're that they're all geniuses, they're all prodigies. Yeah. And I and I especially wanted to give a great shout out to Adele. What a wonderful wonderful thing that she did for that young woman. And and these are the kinds of role models that that I want to see more of. We've seen we've seen Katy Perry do wonderful things mm -hmm. uh, in concert. Right. And, and Adam now, Adam now, Levine. Adam Levine, who yeah. got down on the floor with the the we young boy Adam. with Down syndrome. We love Adam. He's a big supporter of Act Today. Um, and this is this is how we teach inclusion. This this is how this is how we go about this. Not by calling people names and saying this doesn't exist. That's not helpful. Um, so I can you hear my dog barking like a crazy loon. Um, but yeah, I, I so Shannon, Shannon has a special needs dog. Um, everybody should know. Um, and she's, she's on she, a gluten free diet. She is on the gluten free uh, diet. Okay, I've never seen the dog because the dog is not allowed to interact with other humans besides family members, which is not surprising to me that you would keep that dog, Shannon. Of course. Uh, well, you would she's be the a person. wonderful dog, and she has a great allegiance to our son, and oh, I know no. nothing would ever happen to him with her around. But whoever had her before mistreated her so badly and clearly had blonde hair. So she's had a great deal of behavior. No wonder you keep me apart from her. I do. And she's had a lot of ABA. Um, <laughs> as strange as that may seem to people, we, we took her to an uh, animal behaviorist. So she's better now, but I, you know, for... For animals, it's really hard to erase that that memory. Mm -hmm. um, Temple Brandon actually talks about that in her books. That if if a horse has been beaten Definitely. by uh, somebody who wears a hat, then, oh, a, yeah. then a horse will react to everyone who has a hat. I can I can. Well, they're very intuitive creatures, as you know. I've been uh, I've owned horses, and ours are donated now to uh, special spirits, but. Um, they definitely have that intuition about who's on their back. Um, 
I I loved having Jack Creamer today, and Kelpie's telling me I only have a minute. This These two hours went by really fast, and I had to get yeah. you on the phone, though, because I didn't have another guest, and I, I just miss you. Um, I missed you, too. But, thank you um, for doing it, though. You were lovely. Well, thank you, but I love Jack Creamer, and... I, I want to talk more about that. He gave me hope because, you know, sometimes I feel because my kid's not a techie like Jem is, your son. I mean, I'm always like, well, Shannon's got it made. Jem can be a coder. What am I going to do with Wyatt, who, you know, an artist? I mean, gee, there's so much room for a fine art, another fine artist in the world today. But I loved what he said about the designing cakes. There's room for everyone. And Wyatt loves to cook. And yeah. I, I just think he gave so much hope to all parents out there. Um, Absolutely. I think the, the name of the movie is a aptly uh, named. Programming and, uh, Hope. Yep. Programming and Hope. I, and, and since he's coming to Los Angeles, I said, we need to, we need to go to see it. When Let's it do there. that. Let's do that. All right. Um, May 7th. Kelby's uh, telling me I've got 15 seconds here, but um, all right. are you well, feeling you. better? And um, are you going to get some rest today? Oh, yes. I'm laying down even as we speak. Okay, well, I'm demanding that you go back to sleep. I'm sorry I disturbed you and no, got no, you no, here, no. but I think our your regular viewers wanted to see you today and know you're okay. And oh, yeah. uh, you will you may be back tomorrow, right? Yes. Okay. Fact, we have an interview tomorrow with Jennifer Jones from Autism Speaks. Okay, great. That, oh, yeah, she's wonderful. We, we're featuring her in an upcoming uh, autism family portraits as well. She's such an inspiration. Uh, yes, she yeah, is. she's a single mom of, of two boys, one who has been severely affected, and she's just such a force in the community. Um, and you've got her tomorrow talking about the upcoming uh, Autism Speaks Walk, right? Yes, which okay. is a great, great event. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm going to let you say your normal sign off, which is uh, goodbye and Give your kiddos a hug for me. Bye-bye And I'm going to say goodbye and give yourselves a hug from me. And Shannon, Yay. go back to bed. Thanks. Bye-bye. All, right. All right. Bye, honey.